Ontario, 1780, prepared and originally presented by Ray Peacock, narrated here by Alan O'Neill. Ontario is a little-known but important ship built to support British strategic operations on Lake Ontario at the time of the American Revolution. In this presentation, Part 1, I will deal with the events leading to the building of Ontario and her loss. Part 2 and Part 3 will follow at subsequent meetings. This is a painting by a friend, marine artist Peter Rindisbacher, showing Ontario at Newark, now the town of Niagara-on-the-Lake. At the end of the French and Indian War, which lasted for the nine years up to 1763, Britain controlled all of eastern North America, having gained enormous areas of land and influence at the expense of the French. It was during this war that General Wolfe defeated the French forces of General Montcalm at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham at Quebec City on the 12th of September, 1759. The massacre near Fort William Henry at the southern end of Lake George, south of Lake Champlain or Lake Champlain, on which James Fenimore Cooper's novel, The Last of the Mohicans, was based, had occurred in 1756. The French and Indian War was the predecessor of the Seven Years' War, which broke out two years later in Europe, involving all the major powers. Both wars were brought to an end in 1763 with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. The British now faced the delicate task of pacifying their new French-Canadian subjects, as well as the many American Indian tribes in the western lands who had supported the French. And while victorious in 1763, Britain would soon face another military threat in North America, this time from its longtime subjects, when another revolution was to take place, the American Revolution. The story of HMS Ontario begins at the time of the American Revolution. The French were unhappy with the terms of the Treaty of Paris. The British Parliament then passed the Quebec Act, giving the French many of the civil rights they wanted, but this then resulted in the British being upset. In 1775, the Americans misinterpreted the disaffection of French Canadians with their new masters, preferring mercantile and farming peace to the disruption of trade and loss of lives by a war. The American offer to Canada to become the 14th state was declined, but Congress believed that the British forces holding Canada were weak and that the Canadians would welcome the Americans as liberators, and an invasion would require only 2,000 men. Taking Canada would eliminate any possibility of the British using it as a base to invade New England and New York. The Americans decided to invade anyway, believing that the French Canadians would rise up in support. Two armies set out to conquer Quebec City. General Montgomery departed from Fort Ticonderoga through Lake Champlain and captured Fort St. John at the mouth of the Richelieu River. Seeing the danger, General Carleton left Montreal for Quebec City, pursued by Montgomery along the St. Lawrence. Meanwhile, Benedict Arnold left Boston and took an overland road through the swamps, high ground and cold weather of Maine, with an army of 1,100 men, but losing troops on the way to disease, starvation, and expiring enlistments. His depleted army of 800 joined forces with Montgomery, and they invaded during a snowstorm on December 31, 1775. In the ensuing battle, Montgomery was killed, and Arnold badly wounded, and the Americans retired to lay siege on to the city. British reinforcements arrived in a small fleet in May 1776, including the frigate HMS Isis and HMS Surprise, carrying 200 regular troops of the 29th Regiment of Foot and Royal Marines. Under Carleton's command, they routed the now disorganized Americans, many of whom were suffering from smallpox, and they retreated along the St. Lawrence and back to Fort Ticonderoga, having suffered the worst defeat of the new republic. The British were now of the opinion that General Washington might repeat this invasion route from Lake Ontario if he did attack at a later time. 
To forestall this, the British developed a three-branched strategy. One, the two regiments garrisoning the western posts should be augmented. Two, the few fighting vessels on Lake Ontario should be increased in numbers and size to include the Haldimand in 1771 at 76 feet long, 150 tons, and having 16 four-pound guns. Caldwell in 1775 at 52 feet, 37 tons, and having two four-pounders. The Seneca in 1777 at 84 feet, 130 tons, and having 10 four-pounders and eight six-pounders. And the Mohawk in 1778 at 51 feet, 47 tons, and having four 12-pounders. All these as compared to the victory of 1759 at 189 feet long, 162 tons, and being equipped with 104 guns at 42 or 32 pounders, 24 and 6 pound ratings. And then three, an aggressive policy of hit and run rating by the new Royalist Ranger Battalions against the Northern New York should be implemented. In 1778, Frederick Haldimand was appointed governor and commander-in-chief of Canada. To defend against invasions from the direction of Lake Ontario, he issued orders for the re-establishment of the former French shipyard at Cataraqui, now Kingston, with its Fort Frontenac. He was persuaded, however, that Deer Island would be better site to build a new shipyard mainly because the harbor at Cataraqui was shallow and because several old French ships had been sunk there. The island is one of the Thousand Islands, lying about a mile east of Lake Ontario in the south channel of the St. Lawrence River. It has a hammerhead shaped bluff about 60 feet high on the western end. Below the bluff are two sheltered coves and in between a flat area suitable for shipbuilding. A battery of guns on the heights could dominate both the main channel of the St. Lawrence and protect the dock area so that vulnerable winter-bound vessels locked in the ice would be protected from overland raiding parties. The prospect of easy defense was clear, so Haldeman agreed to the location of Deer Island for the shipyard and a fort. The island was soon to be renamed Carleton Island after Sir Guy Carleton, who preceded Haldeman as governor. And the fort was called Fort Haldeman. Haldeman chose the Scottish-born Lieutenant John Shank of the Royal Navy to oversee the construction of the new dockyard and to produce vessels quickly. In the fall of 1778, about 30 whaleboats whose swift but uncomplicated design made them easy to repair, and each capable of accommodating 14 men, were built in a few weeks. They were suitable for transporting raiding parties of battalion strength, about 400 men, for moving up the Oswego River, across Lake Oneida, and on up the Mohawk Valley. In the winter of 1778, three gunboats were started each about 60 feet long, powered by 36 oarsmen and armed with a 12-pounder gun mounted in the bow. These were completed in the spring of 1779. The next major project to fulfill the requirement for strengthening the fleet on Lake Ontario was the construction of Ontario. The master shipwright posted to Lake Ontario was John Coleman, a professional trained at Royal Navy Dockyards. He had worked with Lieutenant Shank in 1776, constructing vessels that were used successfully at the Battle of Valcour Island on Lake Champlain. When work began on Ontario in earnest in early autumn 1779, the civilian workforce consisted of 70 men. Coleman, had earlier completed repairs to the Snow Haldimand, 76-footer, 150 tons, 16 four-pounders, built at Oswegatchie, now Ogdensburg, 
in 1771, and the Navy hired sloop Angelica, 52 feet, 66 tons, six swivel guns, built on Lake Erie. In so doing, he gained experience of the structure of ships needed to withstand the hazard of the Great Lakes. He knew that the new vessel's life expectancy was, at best, seven to ten years, and speedy completion was critical because Haldeman could not hold together much longer. The hull must withstand the pressures of winter ice every year and the grinding of ice flows each spring, conditions of which for Admiralty designers back in England had no experience. Running aground in the river and its approaches would be a common event. There is no tide to simplify careening when keel or bottom damage required repairs. Timber, however, was cheap, plentiful, and massive, so different from the available to the British shipyards, and Coleman was able to avail himself of a ready supply of oak, framing his vessels on the robust side, subordinating neatness to strength, ensuring sturdiness. She was a draft horse rather than a thoroughbred. On this copy of the draft, the as-built drawing, John Coleman wrote, A draft of the Ontario, launched at Carleton Island, the 10th of May, 1780. Length on the lower deck, 80 feet, 0 inches. Of the keel for tonnage, 64 feet, 8 and 5 8 inches. Breadth extreme, 25 feet, 4 inches. Depth in hold, 9 feet, 0 inches. Burthen in tons, 226 and 55 94 P.S. Carleton Island is in Lake Ontario, about 154 miles northeast of Niagara. He signed it, J. Coleman, with a flourish. The armament appears at the bottom of the drawing almost as an afterthought. Guns, 16 six-pounders, six four-pounders. He consigned the drawing, the only contemporary drawing known to exist, to the mailbag, which he addressed to the Admiralty Whitehall, London, and which now resides in the collection of the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich. On May 10, 1780, Ontario was launched. The draft shows Ontario as a brig, with two masts, a main and a foremast, but information available later confirmed she was rigged as a snow. Here we see the difference between a brig and a snow, each having a main mast, but the snow rigged ship has an auxiliary snow mast aft of the main mast that allows the gaff on the snow and the yard on the main to be lowered or raised independently, whereas on the brig this cannot be done, as the one interferes with the other. To build such a large ship as Ontario on an island remote from conventional sources of supply with a largely untrained labor force and a climate so different in its extremes from any previously experienced and under the constant threat of attack was a challenge and a considerable accomplishment. Ironically, Carleton Island was to be ceded to the U.S. in 1817. Throughout that summer of 1780, Ontario transported troops, stores, and civilian merchandise around and across the lake, stopping frequently at Niagara and Carleton Island, down the St. Lawrence River to Oswegatchie, Ogdensburg, occasionally making regular calls to Oswego. Ontario's commander and commodore of the lake squadron was Captain James Andrews. His wife Elizabeth and their son and two daughters lived at or near Navy Hall in Port George, Newark, now Niagara on the Lake. All the vessels carried a complement of soldiers serving as Marines. In 1780, the 34th Regiment of Foot, renamed the Cumberland in 1782, supplied the Marine detachments for Lake Ontario with the balance of the battalion stationed in garrison at Carleton Island. A brig or snow normally carried one or two infantry officers 
several petty officers, including the first mate, the boatswain, the carpenter, and the gunner, two sergeants, and a drummer, and fifty to sixty soldier marines, made up the military complement. Four or five soldiers' wives might be on board, drawing rations but no pay, and doing much of the cooking, laundry, and uniform repairs. Forty seamen made up the ship's crew. A major concern for Captain Andrews was the constant danger of Americans seizing one or more of the large armed vessels, particularly in the confining waters of the St. Lawrence. Hostile Oneida patrols watched the narrow channels of the Thousand Islands and shadowed the vessels between Oswegatchi, Ogdensburg, and Carleton. To counter this threat, the crew of Ontario was kept strong in numbers. <clears throat> Perhaps because of her defensive strength, no actual assault on her and other vessels is recorded, although Carleton Island workers were taken prisoner from time to time, even in broad daylight, by daring American patrols. On at least one occasion, General Haldeman was worried to the point of ordering dispatches from Colonel Bolton, Commandant of Fort Niagara, to be encased in lead. They were to be thrown overboard should the Americans intercept the ship. Ontario never suffered attack from American forces. Throughout the war, the third branch of the strategy, defend the St. Lawrence route to Quebec by reinforcing the garrisons and rebuilding the fleet of Ontario. Raids were made on revolutionary communities. These raids generally were designed to achieve several goals. One, to rescue loyalists who were enduring continued harassment by local rebels. Two, to destroy barns, homes, and more importantly, the harvests and livestock which fed General Washington's armies in the South. And three, to damage the morale of the rebel communities. So effective were the raids on New York State that by the end of the American Revolution, the Mohawk Valley was battered and useless. In the October raid of the Mohawk Valley, anything north of the valley was clearly under British control. The 1780 raid on the Shohari area, however, was largely a mission of pure destruction. A force consisting of 400 men was to carry out the raid. Named the Burning of the Valleys campaign, their goal was the destruction of crops designated to supply the Continental Army, and then to tie up the rebel forces in defensive roles. The 1780 grain crop of western New York was exceptional and the importance of this bounty to the hungry Continental Army was well known to Sir John Johnson and General Haldeman. The long series of raids from Lake Ontario along the Mohawk Valley had forced General George Washington to assign a considerable garrison to the area. In late September, Ontario sailed from Carleton Island to Oswego with troops, canoes, and supplies under the command of Sir John Johnson. Several Indian chiefs and their men accompanied him. Three Iroquois chiefs, Joseph Brandt of the Mohawks, Disappearing Smoke of the Seneca, and Corn Planter of the Wolf, accompanied by 265 warriors. Ontario then set off for Niagara, passing the 18-gun snow Seneca, 84 foot, 130 tons, and the small four-gun sloop Mohawk, 51 foot, 47 tons, which were bound for Oswego with raiding troops from Niagara on board. Colonel John Butler with 200 rangers, 140 troops of the King's Regiment, 8 foot, 10 men, 4th Battalion, Royal Artillery. These Niagara troops brought a grasshopper field gun and a cohorn mortar. Here we see the three-pound grasshopper gun, so-called because it hopped backwards when fired, and the portable cohorn mortars. Ontario was to pick up a detachment of another 34th Battalion Company at Niagara for transfer to Carleton Island, and after a campaign lasting a month, return to Oswego by October 30th was ordered by Johnson. Despite setbacks, huge quantities of grain were destroyed, 600,000 bushels by one estimate. In present-day terms, this is the equivalent of 16,800 tons, the capacity of 265 present-day rail freight cars, the equivalent of four average freight trains. 
in addition thirteen grist mills, some saw mills, and about one thousand barns and houses were burned. British casualties in the campaign were only nine killed, two wounded, and fifty two missing, although many of the missing were simply lost and eventually turned up at Carleton Island. Over one hundred Americans were killed, including Colonel Brown, their commander. On October 24, 1780, Johnson's group started on the return journey, setting out for Oswego and arriving the next day. Butler's Rangers, a detachment of the 8th Foot, artillerymen, and most of the Iroquois rode on to Niagara after a few days' rest in the ruins of Fort Ontario at the mouth of the Oswego River. The company looked in vain for Ontario, which was expected to be at Oswego rendezvous at the end of October, as ordered by Johnson. They were not to see this ship again. Here we once again see Ontario at Fort Niagara. At Fort Niagara, the commanding officer, Colonel Mason Bolton, had given refuge to bands of Indians who had fled from Ontario Valley because of harassment by American rebels. This present-day photo of the fort shows it remains hardly changed from when built by the French in 1726. Its unconventional design was an indication to the local Indians that its main purpose was to be peaceful, as reflected in its name, House of Peace and Trading Post. Its six-pounder guns were housed on the top floor and located behind the matriculation projections. These were fitted with trap doors from which projectiles could be dropped on any enemy personnel who approached the walls. The Indians, having been given refuge and supplies due to the destruction of the 1778 raids of the Ohio Valley, had consumed much of the garrison supplies of fresh fruit and vegetables. One such result was a lack of vitamin C, causing scurvy, and Colonel Bolton had himself begun to suffer. He had been granted permission to return to England for medical treatment. On October 31, 1780, 241 years ago, Colonel Bolton took advantage of Ontario's destination of Oswego for the start of his return trip to England, embarking with the following passengers and crew. Captain Andrews, 29 or 40 seamen, Lieutenants Plough and Colton, 34th Foot Cumberland Regiment Detachment, two privates, King's Regiment, 8th Foot, two butlers, Rangers, one gunner, four women and children, one civilian passenger, four Indians or Native Indigenous people, 19 or 30 American prisoners, a total of 107 to 129 souls. Ontario left Niagara with a fair wind under clear skies. However, she did not arrive at Oswego as expected. The following day, wreckage was found by search parties on the south shore. Ships, boat, and oars, grating, binnacle, part of the quarter gallery, blankets and clothing, a naval officer's three-cornered hat with the inscription J. Law, hat maker, St. James, London, and the initials J. A. for James Andrews, the captain. Once again, we see her in Peter Rinlisbacher's painting at the end of this part of the story. Part two of my presentation will continue with the cause of her loss and her eventual discovery. In part three, I will describe the model I have begun building for some time. This concludes the presentation. <laughs>